All right, well, let's go ahead and get out our Bibles. Turn your Bible on. If, uh, if, you, if you're using a, a phone or, uh, or an iPad or something like that, get your Bible on. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 10, and you may want to go ahead and get out that listening guide that you received on your way in so that you can take some notes and follow along. And if you haven't had a chance to fill out that Connect card yet, fill out your prayer request, there's still time to do that, and you can hand that to anyone on your way out the door. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to personally meet you yet, my name is Aaron, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here. And after the service, I usually hang around right down front here. And if you're new around here or I just haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love the opportunity to connect with you and at least put a name with a face. So we'd love to meet you after church. Uh, we've been in this study in the book of Acts, and last week we looked at Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10, God made it so that all foods were clean and acceptable. And I want you to know that at Indian Rocks, we take God's word very seriously. <laughs> so this week at the Jamboree, I had a corn dog, a cheeseburger, fries, grouper sandwich, coconut shrimp, arepas, corn fritters, apple fritters, two funnel cakes, rice beans, plantains, and two trips to Kona Ice. And so today, I'm going to have some barbecue and corn on the cob, if you're wondering. And I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor Aaron, I, how come you didn't get an elephant ear? I'm not a glutton, guys. I'm just, everybody's got their limits. Well, we've been uh, looking at the book of Acts because this tells the story of the early church and how the church got its start. And if you ever want to know how churches got started, just read the Bible. This is all where it came from. In fact, it started in a conversation between Jesus and his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says to the disciples, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And those disciples didn't even know what a church was. This is the first time church is ever even mentioned in history, this ecclesia, this gathering, this group of believers. And so a little bit later, Jesus is fleshing this out further with the disciples in Matthew 28. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into the far reaches of the earth telling everyone about me. And I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, just like we were doing over here today. And I want you to teach them everything I've commanded you. And don't worry, I'm with you to the end of the age. And the disciples are thinking, wait a minute, you want us, this little group of 12 people, to go to the ends of the earth? And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, don't worry, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses, that word means martyrs, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if you follow through the book of Acts, really if you follow through the whole New Testament, that's exactly what happened. These disciples took the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it started in Acts chapter 2. They received this incredible power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. In fact, this guy Peter, who was a coward, a chicken, this guy denied Jesus three times. He starts preaching with boldness. And all of a sudden, 3,000 people come to Christ in an instant. And then a little bit later after that, 2,000 more people come to Christ. Then the Bible says that God is adding daily to the church every single day. More and more people coming to Christ, coming to Christ, coming to Christ. Then the Bible tells us there was this multiplying movement. It just could not be stopped. But there was opposition to the early church. There was opposition from outsiders. Religious leaders were constantly trying to snuff out the church. Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes, even the high priest himself was trying to snuff out the church, but God wouldn't let it be snuffed out. And then there was opposition from the inside. Believers who'd lost their way. Ananias and Sapphira, filled with greed. There was this accusation of racism. There was this multi-generational challenge of taking care of the widows. And so God raised up deacons to help tamp down any differences and any, uh, any division that was happening in the early church. God was preserving his church. And these guys had a message. They didn't get caught up in political messages. They weren't trying to build a brand or a business. They stuck to one singular message, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he was crucified on a cross for the sins of the world, and he was raised from the dead. That was their message. We call it the gospel. So they just stuck to this message over and over and over again. The church kept growing and growing and growing. And by the time you get to Acts chapter 10, the church is about 8 to 10 years old. So this is about 8 to 10 years after Pentecost. The gospel has now made it outside the walls of Jerusalem to Judea 
and Samaria. Not quite ends of the earth yet, yet, but they're getting there. This thing is growing and it's moving. And the early disciples believed that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone. Everyone. Anyone. As long as they're Jewish. Because <laughs> that was the sentiment. Because you got to remember, Christianity started as a Jewish faith from Jewish people, with a Jewish Messiah. And they had thought up until this point that Christianity was only for the Jews, that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved as long as they're Jewish. Because if you're not Jewish, then that means that you are a no good Gentile dog. That's the way you were considered. In fact, every good Jewish man would wake up every morning and he would pray a prayer something like this. Dear God, I thank you that you did not make me a slave, a woman, or a Gentile. Welcome to the first century in the Greco-Roman world. That's what it was like. It was horrendous. And so Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, I think you guys have got it all wrong. You see, the Jewish people, they thought that they were this chosen group of people, and they were, but they got the word chosen all mixed up. They started thinking about it sometimes the way that my kids think about it. You know, we've got four children. We've got three sons and a daughter, and my, my boys, they, they always think that Amanda and I play favorites, you know, and they get all confused thinking that we have a favorite child, and I tell the boys all the time, guys, you don't have to be confused about that. Um, our favorite is our daughter, Grace. She's sitting right over here. We, we love her more. She's, she's our favorite, you know. We do show partiality. It's, it's to her. And that's kind of the way the Jewish people thought about their relationship with God. Well, of course, we're the favorite child. He loves us more. He, he does not love those other people as much as he loves us. And Jesus shows up and he says, no, you got it all wrong. You are chosen, but you were chosen to be a light to the nations. That's what it means to be chosen. I've given you this one job, this special assignment, so that you can show the watching world that I love everybody, every person from every place, every neighborhood, every race, and your job is to tell the world. Instead, the Jews, they box themselves off with these rules and religiosity, and they fence themselves in so that they could just have this private little relationship with just them and God, them and God, them and God. Boy, I'm so glad Christians don't do that today. This is how the Jews thought about their relationship with God. And God says, I love the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This Jewish people group, they turned all of this into a man-made religion, man-made traditions, man-made customs. And we looked at this last week. So we've got this guy, Peter. Peter was one of the inner three disciples. Pete, Jim, and John, those were the three if anyone knew anything about Jesus, it was one of those guys. They were there at the transfiguration. They had been on many secret conversations with Jesus. I mean, he is one of the three. In fact, G uh, Peter was there when Jesus got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? And Peter's the one who pulled out a sword and chopped off the ear of a Roman soldier named Malchus. You remember that? And then what we saw last week is just a few years later, Peter is inviting Gentiles into his house. How does he go from ear chopping to fist bumping friendship? <laughs> Something has happened in the life of Peter. So what happened? Well, here's what happened. So Peter is a Jew, grew up in a Jewish home, Jewish parents. He believes in the Jewish customs. He holds to the Jewish laws. He holds to the Sabbath. He tries to follow the Ten Commandments. And there's probably no more important rule for him than following the food customs. This was a really big deal to Peter. But one day, Peter was out on the rooftop praying, and all of a sudden he smells the aroma of kosher food cooking down below, and he falls into a heavenly trance. And all of a sudden he sees this sheet coming down from heaven, being let down by its four corners, and inside this sheet are all kinds of animals that a Jew was not permitted to eat. It was the first vision of pigs in a blanket just coming down from heaven. <laughs> and he sees bacon-wrapped scallops 
dancing like sugar plums in his head. And pork chops. And mojo chicharrones. You know what I'm talking about? He sees this food coming down and the pork chop says, Peter, eat me. I'm here for you. You know you want me. And he says, no, no, why am I having this dirty thought, this vision? This is not a Jewish vision. This is a Gentile vision. That's Gentile food. I don't eat that. Lord, never shall I let that unclean food come into my mouth. And God says, eat it, Peter. In fact, God has to tell him three times. And so after this vision, three Italians show up at the door. <laughs> Salami sandwich eaten, uncircumcised Roman Italians. And they knock on the door and they say, Peter, I got an offer that you can't refuse. <laughs> and they say, hey, we've heard it in a vision from an angel that you need to come and visit our friend Cornelius. Now, Jews and Gentiles didn't get along, but Peter does the unthinkable because God is softening Peter's heart, and all of a sudden, he lets these three salami sandwich-eating Italians into his house. And more than that, he puts out a spread for them. He treats them as guests. He lets them stay the night. No Jew would ever do this. The next day, Peter gets up and he goes all the way to Caesarea with these guys and he meets up with their commander, Cornelius, and they make their salutations and Cornelius is so happy to see this guy because an angel told him in a vision that this guy, Simon Peter, is going to bring salvation to your house, not just for you, but for your entire household. And he was thinking, I never thought salvation could come to a Gentile. And there they are. And so they meet each other and they talk. And Peter says, yeah, I've seen a vision. And Cornelius says, yeah, I've seen an angel. And Cornelius says, well, I've listened to the angel. I've done everything he said. And Peter says, well, I've listened to this vision. I've done everything it says. And so we're at this place where someone needs to do something. It's as if Cornelius is saying, what must I do to be saved? This is like a preacher's dream right here. Okay, all the conditions are right. This guy is simply saying, what must I do to be saved? And that's where we pick it up in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, now before I tell you what he said, it's really important that you acknowledge that Peter opened his mouth and used words because there's this notion going around that all you have to do to lead people to Christ is just be moral. If you'll just be a good Christian and live out your Christian life in front of people, then they're going to become Christians by osmosis. It's just going to fall all over them, and they're going to automatically understand that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. They're just going to understand it by osmosis. You know, like St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel always and use words if necessary. Well, I got news for you. Words are necessary. You have to open your mouth. At some point, you have to share the gospel with them. You have to share the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus with them. And by the way, St. Francis never said that, okay? So you have to use words. This is why Paul said in Romans chapter 10, he says this, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. You might think you have an ingrown toenail. You might think you have bunions. You might think you have corns on your feet. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Why? Because you're the one carrying the message of the gospel. And you can't get saved unless someone uses words. What are the words? That Jesus was crucified on the cross for your sin. That he was buried and God raised him from the dead. And anyone who repents of their sin and believes in the gospel will have everlasting life. That's why the Jews are supposed to be a light to the nations, to bring this message. So when they ask about salvation, Peter opens his mouth, and when he opens his mouth, what does he share? The gospel, verse 34. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. God doesn't have favorite children. To which all of the Jews in the room, the guys that came with Peter, are probably thinking, wait a minute. Because 
all this time up until now, Jews have believed that God does show partiality, that he does have favorites. What do you mean God shows no partiality? And I'm sure they're just sitting back listening. I can't wait to hear this. Verse 35, but in every nation, check this out, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. In other words, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Any person from any place, any neighborhood, any race, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God doesn't want anyone to perish. Verse 36, as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of how many? All, Jews and Gentiles. He's Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea. You've heard the stories. Jesus got a reputation now. You know what he did. Beginning from Galilee after the baptism of John, that John proclaimed how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Wait a minute, he healed all? Like Jews and Gentiles? Yeah, all. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. In other words, we were there. We saw when he healed Gentiles. We were there. We saw when he healed the Samaritan woman at the well, the Samaritan dog. He healed her. He did not hold back. He's not discriminating. He's healing all people. We were there whenever he healed the Gentile Canaanite woman's daughter. We saw it with our own eyes. He is not just a Jewish Messiah. He's a Messiah for all, for everybody, from any place. So finally, Peter gets it. And he says, yeah, we're special. We're supposed to be a light to the nations. God wanted everyone to be saved. So then Peter gets very specific about his gospel message. Verse 39, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. They're trying to display the physical nature of the bodily resurrection. Okay, we ate with him. We drank with him. This resurrection was not a hologram, not a hallucination. This was not just a spiritual resurrection. This was a physical, bodily resurrection of the dead. We were with him. We ate with him. We drank with him. I'm trying to tell you guys, he's alive. He's not dead. He's alive. And then, to put an exclamation point on it, verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the appointed one. By God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that, check this out, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This was revolutionary at that time. Everyone? Yeah, everyone. Anyone can receive forgiveness. How do you get that? What's well, in his name? This is why later on, St. Paul wrote that there is neither Jew nor Greek slave nor free, male nor female. There's this fundamental equality. In other words, there's one race, the human race, because we're all made in the image of God. We all bear the imago dei. We're all made in his image. This is revolutionary. This is why years later in the face of racial slavery, believers wrote Christ, Christ, Christmas carols that said things like this. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. That's what Christianity does. Christianity did not come to build walls up. It came to tear walls down. Christianity did not come to put chains and shackles on you in these barriers and barracks of religi religiosity. It came to break the chains. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother part of the family. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Boom. In an instant, these, these Gentiles, <laughs> salami sandwich eating, uncircumcised Gentiles, they get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just falls on them and all of a sudden, boom, their eyes are opened. Their ears are open. Their hearts are open. 
They start to understand all of this in a way that they've never understood it before. And you know what I'm talking about because many of you have experienced this. There was a time when you were dead and then spiritually you became alive. There was a time when you were spiritually blind, but now, boom, God opened your eyes and you can see it happened. And when they believed, the same thing happened to them that happened to us. We received the Holy Spirit. All of the Holy Spirit, not just part of the Holy Spirit. Just like Acts 1.8 says, you'll receive Holy Spirit power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is what happened to them. It's what happened to us. Verse 45, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter, they were amazed. Now, these are the six Jews that traveled with Peter. They're looking at all this and they're, they're freaking out right now. What just happened? How in the world did the Holy Spirit just fall? Holy Spirit, are you okay up there? Because you just fell on some Gentiles. I just want to make sure you know what's going on because down here, this looks really strange because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles for they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. What a miracle. I mean, we always knew that this would happen, but in our minds, it only happened to Jews. Now it's happening to the Gentiles too? Yeah, because... Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. And then Peter speaks up and he declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days. Now skip down to chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Uh-oh. Okay, this is trouble. Word's gotten out that now the Gentiles are coming to Christ. Verse two, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. I've been to a lot of parties in my day. <laughs> I've been to wedding showers and baby showers. Yesterday, I went, to, I went to an eight-year-old birthday party at Top Golf. I ain't never been invited to a circumcision party. <laughs> ain't no party like a circumcision party. <laughs> if anyone ever invites you to a circumcision party, don't go. <laughs> that does not sound like a good party. So the circumcision party's there, and they're all speaking up, and they got issues with these Gentiles receiving the gospel, receiving the Holy Spirit. So what they have to say to Peter? Verse three, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? I mean, this whole passage makes me wanna just wash my hands. I don't know about you, but this is weird. Um, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. So in other words, Peter's just gonna say, hey, let me just tell you from my own words, what happened, okay? Because I know rumors getting out. You've heard about the Gentiles. You're all upset about this. Let me tell you what happened. Peter began to explain to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me, and looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air and cheese conies and pork rinds and bacon-wrapped shrimp and... Sorry. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at my house, the Italians, in which we were. And they sent to me, uh, they sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. Because all my life I've made distinction. All my life I've shown partiality. But what I'm learning is that God shows no partiality, and God's now telling me not to make any distinction. And so these six brothers, they accompanied me because I needed some alibis, and we entered this man's house, and he told us how he had seen an angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon who's called Peter and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God 
gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Who was I that I could stand in God's way? Verse 18, don't miss this. And when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, then, I guess to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Aren't you glad, Gentiles? <laughs> and the world was changed forever. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you are not Jewish by birth? Anyone in the room not Jewish by birth? Man, I'm so glad the gospel came for Gentiles too. E even the circumcision party was convinced of it. Did you notice that? God was doing a new thing with these people, a new thing. You know, God's doing a new thing here at our church too. And it's not new because it's a new message. It's the same message we've been preaching at this church for decades. God's doing a new thing because he's doing a new thing in your heart. In the hearts of people, God is coming alive in a special kind of way. God did a new thing in my heart when I was in 10th grade. I grew up in a small little town about an hour from here over near Lakeland. And when I was growing up, our, our family moved to Florida from New Jersey when I was one. And if you're from New Jersey and you're Italian, when you go to church, you probably go to the Catholic church, which is where we went. But we weren't super active. I mean, we, we like to say that we were CEO Catholics, Christmas and Easter only. That's when we would go to church. And when we went, we had a great experience, but I just didn't go to church very often. But growing up in Central Florida, I had a bunch of friends who were Christians, and I always thought they were kind of weird, especially the Baptists. Like, I thought those were the weirdest ones. They, they were always trying to get me saved, you know? And I always thought, saved from what? What are you even talking about? And their methods for getting me saved were not, were not always the most effective, as you can imagine, you know, these 12-year-old Baptists running around in my neighborhood. They, they would always start with uh, talking about Mary. And they'd say things like, well, why do you pray to Mary? She's not God. You should pray to Jesus. And let me just give you a little advice. If you're trying to witness to a Catholic, don't start with mama, okay? <laughs> we kind of take offense to that. We hail her, okay? Then eventually, when I was 16, I, I remember hearing this tiny little Bible verse in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that by grace you're saved through faith. And it's not by works, not based on anything that you've done. It's a free gift from God. No one can brag about it. And that verse changed my life. It opened my eyes and my mind to Christ, and it also opened my mind and my eyes to Christianity. And I started hanging out with more Christians, and I started leaning into Christian culture, and I still thought that they were weird, but I, I wanted something that they had, and I didn't really even know how to describe it, but I could tell their life was different. The way they processed the world was different. This one little verse, it just started changing my life. I remember one time hanging out after youth group on a Wednesday night. We went to McDonald's right there on South Florida Avenue. And I was sitting in that greasy booth, and I ordered a quarter pounder with cheese and a big mountain of fries. And just before I was going to dive into that meal, one of the high school buddies sitting next to me says, hey, before we eat, we should pray. And I thought, I got this, no problem. Like, I know how to do this. And he prayed the weirdest prayer I've ever heard in my life. Dear God, we thank you for this meal. God, please help it to nourish our bodies. We know it's only about 60% real beef, but Lord, please, <laughs> somehow let it nourish us. And I'm thinking, well, I know God can do miracles and everything, but that is so bizarre. Because when I prayed, my prayers were scripted and memorized. That prayer sounded so uneducated. Like, what is that? I thought, man, these guys are so strange. And the longer I hung out with them, the more I started realizing that prayer wasn't really about perfection. It was more about a relationship that I'm building with my heavenly father and that I could talk to him about anything at any time. And I didn't just have to go to church to pray. I could pray anytime, and God was changing me. Up until this point, I always thought that the meaning 
of life was success. And I just kind of thought that if I could just keep being more and more successful, that I would be good with God. I kind of looked at it like a judge looks at the scales of justice. If I could just do more good than bad, then we're good. I'm good with God. As long as I can do more good than bad, I'm good with God. But that's not how it works at all. Because Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says it's not by works. It's by grace alone that you're saved. I, I remember my youth pastor teaching me about the omnipresence of Christ. It means that Jesus is always with you. Now, he didn't use that big word. What he said was, hey, when you're out there in the car with your girlfriend and the windows start steaming up, Jesus is with you. And that terrified me. <laughs> it scared me to death. I remember learning that salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I remember learning that in the beginning, God made the whole world, and he made it perfect. And there was no sin and no defect. And then humanity sinned in the garden. We invited sin into the world, and it didn't just break us on the inside. It broke all of creation. All of nature is crying out that the world is broken, and we all feel it today. But then in Genesis chapter 3, after the brokenness entered the world, God made a promise, and he didn't just make it to Adam and Eve. He actually made this promise to the devil. He looked at the devil, the serpent, and he said, I'm going to put enmity between you and your offspring, devil, between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the devil. And one day, there's going to be a rescuer who comes, and he's going to come through Eve. He's going to come through humanity. And one day when he comes, he's going to crush your head, devil. That's what he's coming to do. And he's going to bruise his heel in the process because he's going to be crucified on a cross for the sins of the world. Theologians call it the Proto-Evangelium, the first mention of the gospel, mentioned right there in Genesis 3.15. And then a little bit later on, Eve gets pregnant. And she's probably thinking, this is it. This is going to be the rescuer. And he grows up and he kills his brother. God gave them another child, a little boy named Seth. And Seth grows up, and through him, this godly promise is preserved. And then one day, there's this guy named Abraham, and God raises him up, and he continues this promise with Abraham. And Abraham believed in God, and the Bible says that because he believed, it's credited it to him as righteousness. It's, it's credited to his account. And so Abraham is believing that one day a Messiah is coming, and then Isaac believes that one day a Messiah is coming. And Jacob believes one day a Messiah is coming. And Moses and David and all the prophets keep looking to this Messiah who is one day coming. And because they believe, they're justified. They're made right. This righteousness is credited to their accounts because they're looking forward to a Messiah. And then Jesus is born. And he's the Messiah. And ever since then, believers look back at the Messiah who came, and it's credited to us as righteousness because we look to the Messiah. In the Old Testament, they looked forward to a coming Messiah. And in the New Testament, we look back at the Messiah who came, and both are justified, made right, because we look to the Messiah. You're made right because you believe. So what does the Bible actually say about salvation? We're learning a lot about this relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, but what does the Bible actually say? If you peel back all the traditions, all the culture, all the man-made religion, what does the Bible actually say about salvation? If you have your listening guide, let's go ahead and fill in a couple of these blanks here. And let, me just, let me just give you a few things to think about before we go here. Number one is this. The salvation is available to everyone who believes. Everyone. No matter where you came from, no matter how much of this stuff you already know or don't know, Salvation is available to everyone who believes. In the Old Testament, salvation came to those who looked ahead to the coming Messiah. They believed in the promises of God, and God credited it to them as righteousness. In the New Testament, we look back at the Messiah who came, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of the world, crucified on the cross for our sins, raised from the dead. We look to him for salvation. Anyone who believes is justified. Both are saved when they believe. So salvation is available to anyone. So the question is this, do you believe? Do you believe? You might say, well, gosh, I don't know if I believe all that stuff. I mean, seriously, like a flood and Adam and Eve, and did they even have belly buttons? And there's so much that I don't know about the Bible. Okay, put all that aside. Do you believe that God sent his son to die on a cross for your sin, and God raised him from the dead. Do you believe that? If you do, 
you're a Christian. If you don't, I'm begging you to believe today. I can't make you believe. But anyone who wants to be saved can be saved. Number two, everyone gets saved the same way. Everyone gets saved the same way. Same in the Old Testament, same in the New Testament. They believe. That's how. Everyone gets saved, saved the same way. It's not by works. It's not by keeping religious traditions. It's not by walking an aisle or saying a memorized prayer or throwing the stick in the fire at youth camp or nailing it to the cross at that revival service. That's not how you get saved. You get saved by believing. You get saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Grace alone. What is grace? Grace is a free gift. It's unmerited. If someone gives you a gift, you don't pay for it. It's just a gift. Okay, now, I have big money right here. This is $20. This right here, it might get you half of a hot dog out there at the carnival. <laughs> okay. Now, during our meet and greet time, when we were shaking hands, I met my new friend right over here. Her name is Hannah. Hey, Hannah. Hannah, I would love to give you $20. Would you like this $20? It's, yeah, okay, that's a good answer, yes. She said, sure. Okay, I know, it's not much, it's 20 bucks, I know. Okay, I wanna give you this. Um, what do you have to do to make this yours? You just have to take it. Because it's free, because that's what a gift is. And the Bible teaches that salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it, you don't deserve it, there's nothing you can do to make it yours. The only thing you can do is receive it. You just have to receive it. You see, the Bible teaches that you don't earn it. It's by grace that you're saved through faith. Faith means believing. You have faith in something. It's not just this nebulous faith. You actually believe in something. So it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You're putting your hope in Christ. He is our foundation. He is our solid rock. So we believe by faith in Christ and that's how anyone's ever saved. Number three, believers receive the Holy Spirit the moment they believe. Believers receive the Holy Spirit the moment they believe. The Holy Spirit's not a two-stage rocket booster. Okay, you don't get saved one minute and then you get the Holy Spirit, and, you know, a few years later when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. Okay, the moment you believe, you get the Holy Spirit. Just like in Acts chapter 10, when Peter visits Cornelius and his family, all of a sudden, the moment they believe, boom, Holy Spirit falls on them. Same happens today. Now, you might be quenching the Holy Spirit. You might be grieving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit might not be as active as he wants to be in your life, but you have him. If you're a believer in Christ, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And what is he doing? Well, he convicts you of sin. He illuminates God's word to you. He comforts you when you need it. He's your counselor. He instructs you in righteousness. The Holy Spirit does in you what Jesus would do if he were physically present with you. That's what he does. Number four, when you believe, belief always impacts behaviors. Belief always impacts behaviors. When you get saved, your life changes. Okay? If there's no fruit, there's no root. When Jesus comes into your life, your life looks different. There's always evidence of your belief. You get baptized. You join a church. You study God's word. You change the way you live, the way you think. Your generosity changes. The way that you volunteer, the way that you give your life to things changes. God comes in, he changes your life. This is why Peter said, why should we hold baptism from these Gentiles? They're believers, the Holy Spirit's on them, let's baptize these guys. So, some of you have a next step you need to take. Some of you need to get baptized, just like those did today here in our service. Some of you need to join this church family or another church family. Some of you need to get into a Bible study. Some of you need some help rearranging your life. You need help in your marriage. You need help right now. The Holy Spirit's come into your life, and you need help. That's why this church is here, and we want to help you. We want to help you recover and pursue God's design, no matter where you're at on the spectrum. Number five, believers experience real life through repentance. Believers experience real life through repentance. For the first time ever, these Gentiles were receiving real life. Something to live for. Something good. Look at verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, well then, 
I guess to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Because that's where real life is. You want to know the pathway to real life? Repentance. Hey, married men in the house, married men, you ever gotten into an argument with your wife? Oh, I guess this is the holy sanctified service. <laughs> you know what it feels like when you're in the doghouse? When things aren't going well? What's the path forward in your marriage? Is it to sweep it under the rug? Act like it never happened? Come up with a really good excuse? The path forward is always repentance. I'm sorry. I was. That's the path forward. You know, God has a path forward for all of us, too. And the path forward is repentance. We repent of our sin and we believe in the gospel. We're not perfect. We still make a lot of mistakes, but we repent of our sin and we believe in the gospel. Some of you need to do that today. And God has brought you here into this room, hearing this message for that purpose. Because he wants you to repent of your sin. He wants you to believe in the gospel. He wants you to live for him. And for the believers in the room today, God took this mission of the Jews being a light to the nations. And at the cross of Christ, he took that mission. And because they weren't doing it, he transferred it to the Christians. And for the last 2,000 years, the Christians have been charged with being a light to the nations. That's why Jesus looked out at the disciples and he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light to the world. You are a light to the nations. No longer am I just going to let my chosen people do this. Now it's up to the Christians. You take this message to the ends of the earth and that's our commission. That's why our church is here. And so if you need that message, you've come to the right place. If you're extending that message, you're in the right place. We are a group of people taking this message to the ends of the earth. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for a church family where we can gather together, where we can grow together, where we can learn from your word. God, I'm so grateful that the gospel has been extended to us. And God, I pray right now for any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, hearing the sound of my voice that needs to trust in you. God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. God, would you please open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, come into our life. God, help us to repent of our sin and believe in the gospel. And God, for the believers that are here today, God, help us to be a light to the nations. God, I'm so encouraged by those who are getting baptized today because a friend invited them here. Imagine the firepower in this room if we're deployed all over this region. God, help us to be the church out there. Help us not to hide the light that we've been given. We pray these things in Jesus' good name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.